Hi friends, Dr. Jim Daly here, Astronomy for Change. Um, back in November, actually beg your pardon, April of 2016, Yuri Milner, a Russian philanthropist, launched to the surprise of many scientists around the world, um, a fantastic project called Break the Breakthrough Initiatives. In this specific uh, case, Breakthrough Starshot, where Yuri, um, named in honor of Yuri Gagarin, the first Russian cosmonaut to, uh, you know, achieve orbit. Um, this Breakthrough Starshot project would see thousands upon thousands of nanoscale Gram mass. robotic craft launched by a high power laser uh, or a microwave laser array launched towards our nearest stellar neighbor in space, the Alpha Centauri star system. And many scientists, many physicists were on board with that. For example, Freeman Dyson, famous physicist from the 1960s and 1970s, who suggested, and his name is uh, these theoretical objects called Dyson spheres are named in his honor where advanced civilizations could theoretically build a sphere around their home star to capture the light and the energy from their star to power their advanced civilization, things like that. So Freeman Dyson first came up with that idea. That was decades ago. Then we had Stephen, Cor Stephen Hawking, who has since been, who was since deceased, um, was part of that. Androyan, the wife and partner and collaborator with the late and famous Carl Sagan. He um, or she was part of this initiative. Many scientists, it's a worldwide collaborative effort to build these nanoscale, basically craft the size of an iPhone that would travel to our nearest stellar neighbor in space, the Alpha Centauri star system, at 20% the speed of light, which would take uh, basically a little about 22 to 23 years uh, at that speed to travel the 4.3 light years between our solar system, the Sun and Earth, to the Alpha Centauri system, which is actually consists of three stars, Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, and Proxima Centauri. And Proxima Centauri B is a red dwarf star around which orbits what many believe to be an Earth-like planet. Okay, so that would be the object of this mission. Uh, not only this would be humanity's first interstellar uh, journey, um, albeit unmanned, if these craft, even one of them survives the journey, the 4.3 year, light year journey, uh, any data, information, or images, anything we got back from them would be unprecedented. Okay, don't forget, it would take 22 years to get there, and the transmission of the signal back towards the solar system to Earth would be another four years. So we wouldn't know if the craft survived and we wouldn't see the images until 26 or 27 years after they were launched, right? So Yuri Milner initiated the, uh, this Breakthrough Starshot, Breakthrough Starshot Initiative uh, back in April of 2016. Here at Astronomy for Change, we, um, we put together a public discussion uh, at a library and I was the host of that discussion, the lecture. I led the lecture. Uh, it was a public lecture. And the rest of this video, um, we're going to present, republish it on our YouTube channel here uh, in its entirety. Um, and I'll discuss the entire mission, its history, implications to humanity, uh, long-term uh, goals and discovery uh, aspirations for humanity and uh, the unprecedented uh, advantage or the unprecedented possibilities of discovery if, if this would actually uh, come to fruition and be successful. So um, the uh, following video is about 40 minutes where I take us through uh, the, some ideas from Einstein and Newton, bring us forward into the future, discuss the initiative, and then I take questions towards the end. So. Um, Without further ado, let's segue now to, uh, to our public discussion of Breakthrough Starshot, uh, humanity's first uh, foray into interstellar space.
article right here, right beyond with this. The, the name of the article is Going to the Stars, Writing on a Beam of Light. That article basically covers what's kind of a concise outline of what I presented in our public discussion. Uh, so that's also part of this. Uh, so without further ado, let's begin. Explain it. the machinations of it, how it worked. But it took Einstein to describe the why. Yes, we have the sun, the earth more opening the sun, the moon opening the earth. Everything can be described almost perfectly, with very few exceptions, uh, using Newtonian's principles, Newton's principles. There's a few really kind of quirky little things like Mercury's orbit is it precisely defined, or can be def precisely described using Newton's ideas. Einstein to do that. So Newton describes the how, the why of it all is that space is really warped. How can space be warped? How can you even imagine that? Clearly, it's an abstraction. So if you consider a large sheet of rubber stretching across this room, Let's say you put a, a bowl in the middle, or maybe a grapefruit in the middle. It's going to make a little bump, right? The bigger that object is, the more massive it is, the deeper that bowl will be, to, to the point where if you put something so big, it'll just basically tear it. That's what we have as a black hole, OK? And in the last few frames of that video we just played, that was a black hole. <coughs> this here. This first term here in the equation describes the nature of the black hole itself. How much stuff is in it, how much mass it has, size, its dimensions. Over here, we have a series of things like energy and momentum, things like that. So this is equal to this. Basically, you can describe every object in the universe using Einstein's equations. And it explains the why, not just the how, of why the universe works the way it does. The special theory of relativity has some very important ramifications. One thing is that nothing in the universe that has any mass to it can travel at the speed of light. If you want to think of it, you can go with this talk. Eventually, how do we get to the stars overcoming all these uh, physical, physical obstacles? Okay. okay, so what would happen and what would a traveler observe while riding on the planet? Well, first of all, nothing that has any mass can travel at the speed of light. Okay, it's the universal speed of light. Light itself is the only thing. Of light, simply because light has no mass to it. Time would slow down as you approach light speed. Length would shorten in the direction of motion, and your mass would increase. And I will, get, I will give you some very a flavor to the magnitude of those changes in the next few slides. But just to give you a little background into this idea of time, let's use time as, um, as a way to describe this. Some famous experiments were conducted in the 19th century, Michael Simone, the experiment one, where the proposition was that, well, the universe is pervaded with this invisible substance called ether. You can't measure it can't interact with it, it's just there. Because the classic idea of a wave is that you need a medium for the wave to travel through. So the thinking was that space is a vacuum. What's the medium? So they invented this idea of an ether. And that idea persisted for a long time. There was two people. James Kirk Maxwell actually gave us a famous set of equations that says a light is a wave. 
the nose of the kingdom. If the Maxwell King Michael son of Mormon. The idea was if the earth is moving around the sun, moving through the ether, if I shine a light in this direction, and I measure the speed of that light, it should be the sum of the earth's speed and the speed of light. Logically, right? And conversely, if I shine the light that way, it should be the difference. You subtract this from this, and you would have the resulting velocity of light in that direction. Well, it turns out that light is directionally invariant in speed. It means the speed doesn't have any effect. The direction of motion of the light has no effect. The light travels the same in every direction, regardless of how fast the object that holds it is moving. Or the source of the light, like the Earth, we shine a flashlight up into space. The beam of light going to the moon is going to travel at the same speed, regardless of the speed of the Earth. So what's changing? If I'm sitting on this hypothetical beam of light, I observe the universe around me. You think to yourself, when I drive in my car, I go from here to New York, it's 40, 50 kilometers, let's say. If I travel 50 kilometers an hour, it takes me one hour to get there. Right? Distance over time is velocity. Velocity equals distance divided by time. Which one of those three terms is changing? Okay. The time. Time doesn't change the speed of light. That's the one variable in all of this that doesn't change. And that's why light is directionally invariant. Okay, and that's a huge plays a huge a huge role in all of this. Now, time slows down. The length of your spaceship is going to get shorter in the direction of motion, and your mass increases according to a certain formula, which is coming up next. Now, okay, according to the gamma factor, and here, just to give you a sense, I don't know if you, how many, can, can you read these numbers? 0. 0.0001, can you guys read this? Okay, this is 0. 0.0001, this is 0. 0.5. 0.5 the speed of light here, the speed of light. This is 95%, this is 99% the speed of light. The fastest man-made object to date is the New Horizon spacecraft that just flew by Pluto last summer. He didn't even get on the chart, and that's the fastest thing we have made. Okay. The idea behind, at the end of tonight, when you leave here, you'll have a better idea of what this, this star shot is going to be. We hope to accelerate tiny little craft to one-fifth the speed of light, or 20%. You'll have a change of 2%. 1.02 is 2% change. Okay, you don't actually see any significant change until you get upwards of 99%, which is seven times. So, if I were to travel to a star, hypothetically, as a young man of, let's say, 20, I had a brand new baby who's just born. Okay? I get on my, my starship, and let's suppose I can travel at the speed of light. I go there to this star 70 light years away. Actually, let's make it 35. 35 and 35. For me, I see no change on my starship. But for them, 70 years have gone by. I return a man of See, 70 years, well, no, it's got a bad example. It's got to be like seven. So if I go out seven and come back, I'm 14 years older. But he's seven times 14. My little tiny baby boy, little girl, is now, has now deceased. And I returned over 14 years ago, 14 years later. That's the upshot. That's, why, that's how much time slows down. If I could travel at 99% the speed of light, Figure all intents and purposes, 99 is 100. For the sake of our little argument here tonight, it's the same number. Seven light years is going to be 7.1 years to get there, 7.1 years to return. So, so 14 years. I've aged 14 years, normal 14 years. My little child is seven times that. So whatever age he left, suppose he was... Um, 
14 times 7. Suppose he was one year, 30 time of yeah. box, then you would have back, he should have 71. Yes, so I'll come back in time to see my grandchildren or my great grandchildren, but I'll be just another 14 years older. So that's the, that's the implications of doing this. Okay, the ma that's time. The mass and the length are also modified according to that same amount. So if I have a starship that's, let's say, 70 meters long, it's now 10 meters long when I get to the speed. It's actually compresses in, my, in the direction of motion. But you don't feel it. You're on board the this, this starship. You don't see everything is going to you. But someone who watches you goes by sees it's, it's really kind of a strange thing, right? And mass, too. So as you get faster and faster, at 99% of the speed of light, you would need seven times the amount of fuel to go the same, to propel you with this, the same energy as you did before, because your mass is still seven times heavier. Seven times more, not heavier. Okay, so that's the implications of this. So how do we overcome these obstacles? How do we, I open up tonight's discussion, are we forever stuck here? Can we ever make a meaningful journey, meaningful in the sense that within a human lifetime, we can accomplish some goals, achieve some mission? Okay, this is a chart that shows, here's our New Horizons spaceship right down here. Okay, that's New Horizons, 100,000 kilometers an hour. It's the fastest thing we ever made. And that was with two gravity assists around Jupiter and Saturn. Flew by in the, in the tremendous gravity of those planets accelerated even more. Okay, fastest thing we ever made. No change whatsoever. Here we are at 95% of the speed of light. And you see what happens now as you get closer to the speed of light? This thing skyrockets and it's what we call asymptotic at one, which is infinite. Time stops. Mass is infinite, and the weight contracts at zero at the speed of light. And, uh, Therefore, it's impossible to have. If the if the mass is infinite, then how much force uh, to the? It's impossible. You can't move it. It's it's in, it's impossible. And these this is why it's impossible. So how do we overcome this impediment to you know significant exploration of our little corner of the universe? How do we do that? Like they say in Star Trek, will we ever fully go with no one has gone before? The latest Star Trek Beyond was really good. It's kind of a little hokey in the beginning, but it actually turns out to be a nice movie. And, okay. So, we're going to the stars, riding on a beam of light. We have one man's vision of humanity's first interstellar mission. How are we going to do that? Yuri Milner asks the big questions in life and the universe. Are we alone? Are there habitable worlds in our galactic neighborhood? Can we make a great leap to the stars? And can we, can we think and act together as one world in the cosmos? Now, implicit in that question is the surmounting of many obstacles, socio-political obstacles. We can, one nation can't do this. But this project, yes, we can. One nation can do this project. But to make a significant, to make significant progress in establishing ourselves, let's say, as a sustainable outpost on the moon, or perhaps maybe even Mars, would require the entire world to be behind and one effort to do this. And we have huge obstacles, not technical obstacles. We have the technology. We have to overcome other things. Okay, and that's implicit in that last question he's asking. Okay. He was born um, in 1961, and Yuri Gagarin completed his suborbital, his orbital flight around the Earth. The first man to orbit the Earth was Yuri Gagarin, and Yuri Milner, Russian, he was named, he's also a Russian, was named in honor of his fellow countrymen back in 1961, and completed the first orbit around the Earth. Okay, so. What is the proposal? The Starshot proposal is a one gram mass scale nanocraft, which is what the mass and dimensions of an iPod or an iPhone, or take care of your mobile phone, about that big, right? 
accelerated to one fifth or twenty percent the speed of light to reach our nearest star neighbor, or who two light years distant in less than twenty three years. It's four point three light years or four point two light years. So it's a factor of five more, five greater than four point two, which is about twenty two years. It would take 22, 23 years to get there. And it's a one-way trip, not coming back. And it's gonna fly through that system like, you know, in a blink of an eye. At one-fifth the speed of light, it's still really fast. Even though it's a tiny little thing, it's, it's really, it's traveling. And you can't stop it. How can you stop it? How are we gonna do this? Why did we choose something so small? Well, you'll come to learn that. The amount of energy required to accelerate anything up to that speed is enormous. Okay. The nanocraft will be accelerated to one feet, one fifth the speed of light using a light sail. Okay. When you go out on a bright sunny day, you don't feel any pressure from the sun. Right? You might feel pressure from the nice breeze or wind and so forth, but you don't feel anything. But in fact, the brilliant sun does provide a certain radiation pressure from the brilliant light. And if you have a large enough sail, very thin, only a few molecular layers thin, you can actually use it in this way. Basically as, as a, a sail to catch the sun's light and pull something if it's small. That's why these objects have to be so small. One, one gram is, is um, It's not that much. It's going to be 20 grams. Huh? Yes. It's going to be 10 or 10 or 20 grams weight. Yes. Yes. An estimate, an estimate mass will be 10 grams more than 10 grams. Yes, yes. How are we going to do this? 100 gigawatt. Now, one watt, everybody knows what 100 watt light bulb is, right? Okay. Imagine a billion of those, 100 watt light bulb. A billion of them. That's 100 gigawatts. That's how much energy is required, sustained over 10 minutes, to accelerate something one gram mass to 20% the speed of light. And again, you'll see how this is going to work. It's a fact. It's an amazing idea. Okay, 100 gigawatt ground-based phased array laser, which means they all act in concert, will accelerate thousands of these nanocraft equipped light sails to 20% light speed in a distance of two million kilometers in the space of 10 minutes. That's about five times the distance to the moon. <clears throat> that acceleration is a staggering 91,000 Gs. 91,000, so when you take off from a plane, gentle acceleration, you really start being pushed into the sea a little bit, that's about two Gs. Maybe not even two Gs. A, a high-speed turn in a, and high performance aircraft is like five or six Gs. Maybe a thousand Gs. Okay. The energy required, so when we work out the numbers in the space of 10 minutes with that initial baseline power, the energy required to accelerate it to 0.2 C. C is the universal symbol for the speed of light, capital C. In 10 minutes, it's equivalent to. 1.8 terajoules of energy, the equivalent of 500 megawatt hours, the sustained 500 megawatts for one hour. You get your life bill, if you build every month your electric bill, how many kilowatt hours do you use? 100, 50, 200, something. That's kilowatt hours. This is megawatts. This is the output of a small nuclear power station. For one hour, the sustained output to accelerate one of those tiny little things that are going to speed. Okay, or it's 4% of all the energy released by the erosion of blast. To accelerate a tiny little thing, 20% of the speed of it.
support of the Park. That's the light sale. This is the ground based face array lasers. Watch. So that's the, when I mentioned a few moments ago about the sunlight having the radiation pressure, that's what the pressure of all those lasers, the combined energy of all those lasers. Keep it focused on that light cell for 10 minutes. It's going to accelerate that thing to 20% of the speed of light. Now that's, That's Alpha Centauri, which is a, basically a carbon copy of our sun, by the way. And there's a smaller, cooler companion, Proxima Centauri, which is a small red dwarf star, which is uh, smaller, and they just recently found, they believe it's a high confidence in the discovery of it, an Earth mass, Earth class planet in orbit around Proxima, which gives us a lot of encouragement. And that's why this, this star shot, that's why, one of the reasons why they chose this as a target was the discovery of the Earth like planet in the morning. Okay. This was in the New York Times. This was in the press. It was um, basically published in quite a different outlet. Okay. They, they, 20 years, that was just a round number. It's going to be a little bit longer. But this is the brainchild of Yuri Milner. Now, the big thing, the big deal with Yuri Milner, he, he donated $100 million in seed funding to start the project. And it's up to the others. That's, it. That's a lot. It's a sizable amount of, of, um, of money. But I think they're going to need more. It's an open project. Everybody's welcome to contribute. This is it's an access, it's open and accessible by the public. If you have any ideas, the website is on the slideshow. At the end, you can see what, you can get the URL. If you want to contribute, if you're interested, if you want to find out more information about this, it's all open to the public, which is really a million dollars in seed funding. Assembled a blue ribbon panel as initial collaborators that include everybody else. Being guys who came to this is a winner on the from science to the now made great, late, great Carl Sagan and Bray. Okay, it's an open project and invite public input and participation. What are some of the challenges? I think the question was asked about what's it going to have on there, right? Let's take a look at the challenges first and that will kind of give us a sense of what, what we can actually do. How are we going to transport, or how are we going to hold the charge for 22 years? Battery. If you don't start your car, it's two, three, or four, we're not going to make a couple months of battery goes dead. Um, we're developing incredible battery technology now. Elon Musk is doing his product, we're going to get effective. And they're building really great batteries, but they got to make them really small, really tiny, something that could fit inside your wallet and be light enough to be put inside this thing and last for 23 years. That's a tall order. And that's the biggest problem right there. We have the technology now to build that light sail and accelerate it. But how dependable will it be, right? How are we going to transmit the data and the images back in cosmic terms? Four light years is not going to do it. Okay. But for us, this tiny little thing has got to Gotta have a tremendous receiver on the other hand, how we can do it. These are all real technical problems, but this is a real project. Okay. Mission continuance over the mission lifetime, 22 or 23 years. When NASA designs missions, they always look for the youngest. The, actually, age goes into it. As opposed to some idea that oh, you're being discriminatory because you're not hiring a, an older person. They want the person around in 10 years or 15 years, they don't want them retiring because God forbid something happened. So they always think of these things, these long-term, like the Cassini mission to Saturn was launched in 97. 
had arrived in 2004. And it's still there. It actually, the mission sunsets next year. It's basically there 20 years. So where we started that mission is still there 20 years later. So this, these are the time scales that are involved. Will, will we have um, the same people around? Will, we, will, will things change? Will the ideas change? Will this mission kind of be forgotten? You've got, it's got, to, you've got to maintain the funding or the support over, um, you know, over the lifetime of the mission. Pointing accuracy of the, of the laser, at least on the, on the acceleration phase. You've got to keep that laser dead focused on those things. If you point off, if you go off by half a degree, you can ascend it off into another part of the galaxy. It's amazing. Okay. What unknowns are between here and Alpha Centauri system that require hundreds or thousands of nanograms to maximize the probability of success? In other words, we're not just going to send one. We're going to make hundreds, maybe thousands of them, and, all, and launch them all at the same time. And probability, there's, there's a higher probability of success in numbers. For, you know, the more you have, suppose something happens, maybe you lose 10% of them. At least most, some of them will survive, most of them will survive to send you back to information. It's a fly-by mission only. So there's no do overs right? And this, obviously there's minimal directional control and guidance once acceleration is achieved, right? Once you reach cruise speed. Can't do anything. They're on their way. Newton's first law: anything in motion will stay that way until something changes it. Newton's first law, right? And they're subject to that. Okay. Why the Alpha Centauri star system? That doesn't really go to answer your question. What can we put on a tiny little thing? Like right now, you're on your mobile phone. You got a camera in there. You got a computer. Um, you got a phone. Got a phone, a phone, a phone home, ET phone home, right? It's the same thing, right? So you want to, but you want to make a long, really a long distance phone call, all that years away. So these are the techniques are the technical problems, and that'll give you some kind of sense of what we can put on this little tiny thing, right? Okay, why do we choose Alpha Centauri? It's the closest star system to ours. It's a, a Alpha Centauri. Alpha, it's actually a triple star system. There's Alpha Centauri A and B, and the Proxima Centauri, which is considered Alpha Centauri C. Alpha Centauri is a, in itself a binary star. A star like our sun, a carbon, literally, the same type, class, temperature, everything as our sun. And a, small, a slightly smaller, less massive, cooler star. And then at a distance, you have Proxima orbiting those two. They're in their own orbit, so it's considered a triple star system. Right now, in this epoch in history, Proximate in its orbit is closest to us. Okay, so this ship, once it gets here, the orbit's not going to change much. It's a very large orbit, so by the time it gets there, Proxima will still be the closest star. So when these things arrive in 25 years, um, they're probably going to fly by Proxima. Although, one degree here, one degree four and a half light years away from here, could be the whole system, could be a huge swath of space. So, um, because of the distance and the speeds involved, we can realize the mission goals within the human lifetime. So this is going to probably take another 10. The way things look like by 2025, 2030, we're going to have a smaller, less ambitious goal of sending some of these to Mars. The travel time to Mars, the normal light speed is like 20 minutes. So this would take 20 times 5 is 100, 100 minutes, an hour and 40 minutes. We'll be there on Mars, and we'll see if it works. Okay. okay so it's there, like I mentioned, stellar analog of our sun. High, high probability. Right now, we found this only was discovered this last year. We have an Earth-mass planet orbiting Proxima. So that means what? That means it could sustain. It could be already have light. We don't know. We we see that it's orbiting. We can tell by the star's perturbation, the movement of the star. We can tell that there's some smaller thing orbiting it. Kind of tends to pull it off its center. Even though its star is much bigger than a planet, it's still gravity has gravity, we can measure gravity down, it's very precise. Okay. Proxima is also the cool red, this is a cool red dwarf star. It's part of the triple star system. Okay. So 
So where is it? Where is Alpha Centauri? If you were to go out tonight, um, where is? Where would you have to look? Well, you can't see it from New York. You have to actually travel actually down to Key West to barely see it. Ideally, you'd have to go down to Mexico, maybe below the equator to see it properly. Okay. Um, so this will give you a sense of where it is. Okay. Rigel Cantaurus is another name for, for Alpha. This is it right here. Right, I'm zooming in on it. These images were produced with a, with a program called Stellarium. It's free download of a great program. Rigel Cantaurus. <coughs> And that's, that's, that's the actual um, picture of the European Southern Observatory's telescope on Chile. This is combined light of both Alpha Centauri A and B, and his props, the tiny little red props are down here. So if basically take about half of this light, that would be the sun. You get a sense of the luminosity difference between this and this. This, take about half of this is the sun. Compare that to this. You can see how much more powerful our sun is than a tiny little red dwarf. And our sun is actually by the same scale as tiny compared to some more tremendous stars, very powerful stars. Okay, and that's an image of Proxima taken with the Hubble telescope. Please keep in mind though that these are that these spikes are artifacts of the optical system inside the telescope. These are support the telescope. You've got a, a big concave mirror at the bottom, you've got a mirror at the top here, and the support system at the top of the telescope creates what we call diffraction. And that's what this is right here. Okay. But that's Proxima Centauri of the telescope. And this is what this, this distant world might look like if we were to travel there, right? That's Proxima. This is some alien planet. We have no idea what it would look like. Some artists, you know, this is what they thought. Okay. If you're interested in more information, the Star, the Breakthrough Initiatives have three current, they have three current ports right now. Breakthrough Listen, Breakthrough Message, Breakthrough Starshot. Yuri Milner has financed all three. Okay, each one will be $100 million to it. Right now, we just talked about the Starshot. Breakthrough Listen is a project where we're listening for evidence of an intelligent signal. A real substantive project with real funding. And real, it's like a, a full-time occupation. We're listening to the sky in many different wave bands, looking for the possibility of interstellar communications. Okay. Breakthrough message is to see if ET is using lasers to actually communicate using right now we have who has fiber optics? So you have files, you have fire fiber optics, right? So what the thinking is well maybe ET is using lasers. It's the same principle that's true. It's in the fiber optics cable. And then we have breakthrough star shot. And each one of them has some initiatives. This is um, our own website with uh, tonight's program. Less than half you just said. We're going to put this up online, this PowerPoint, within the next 24 hours if you want. If you go to the website, you can download this, um, this PowerPoint if you like. Um, and any questions? We talked about a lot tonight. We? we talked about relativity, general general and special relativity. Basically, the idea with relativity, the big deal, is that there's no absolutes. There's no reference frame. This idea. Like this room is what we call an inertial reference frame. Everything's the same in here. We go out to the street, that's a different reference frame. There are no absolute reference frames from which you can measure something. The universality of this, um, the special theory just deals with Inertial frames. We're sending so many. Oh, okay. We're sending thousands. Oh, yeah. I'm thinking only hundreds at least. If you have a 10% failure rate, you'll at least get a sizable amount and you'll get through, right? 
so you could have some bread. <laughs> That's a gram. That's the size of like a rich cracker. We have our mobile phones, we have cameras and phones on the way, batteries. But the battery charge we have lasts the last 20 years. That's a big problem. That's why he's giving them a lot of money. So let's keep our fingers crossed that they do it. It's really an exciting idea. But this is one this is one way where we can over, overcome that seemingly insurmountable obstacle of reaching out beyond our little corner of the universe. So because the distance and I guess, uh, if let's say uh, Marcus wants to get the feedback, yes, it will already go on. Crazy it will take it. four years for the information. Mm -hmm. Once it flies by, we have to add a tack on another four years for the information to get to us. Mm -hmm. So, I suppose it takes 22 years. So, from the date of launch, we have to wait 27 over 27 years for the first images to see. I did this one important point I don't think I, I explained adequately, the idea of a light year. I've been using that term. It's a distance light travels in one year. This star system is 4.3 years in terms of light travel time away. The moon, the sun is eight and a half minutes. So the light we see from the sun is left at eight minutes away. Mars is 20, 20 light minutes away. One and a half light per second. Yes. Yes. It'll be like that. That, that. that video was just one. A picture that one is you know, thousands of those. Maybe not in one shot. Maybe in several shots. The phrase of punch. Um, and the idea, of course, is if you, if you have many, you can maximize the probability of success. Is that today we will see super moon? Oh, tonight would have yes. Tonight is the super moon. What is the super moon? Bright, brightness. Bright is bright. Yes, it is bright. But why is it a super? Why do we call it a super moon? Okay, the mm. two events. The fact that it's a full moon, or this could happen on a new moon as well, and the moon in its perigee. Everything, all orbits are elliptical. That's a fundamental fact of, of nature. The moon is in orbit around the Earth. It's almost round, but it is an ellipse. So the point at closest approach is called the curvature. The aperture is the point of furthest approach. So tonight, it just so happens the confluence of the full moon phase and the perigee gives us what we call the super moon. The moon does appear slightly bigger in the sky. It's measurable, it's a little bit bigger because it's simply closer. And that can happen on a new moon. Or full moon. Unfortunately, it's cloudy, but normally at these events, what I do is we have a small telescope, binoculars. We probably go outside, we have a little observation, observing session after a program. Just to kind of put it nice and okay. So that's a full moon, a uh, super moon. We've had a few of them. In fact, once of last, last year, we it's had a one, two years super back, we had, we had last September, we had September 15th, last year, so that's September. We had the the super blood moon. The super blood moon is when a lunar eclipse occurred at the same time. Now, a lunar eclipse can only happen during the full moon phase because white passes into the shadow. And that only happens when they're all light. Is the sun, is the earth, is the moon. It's orbiting. So, when the moon passes into the earth's shadow, we look up, the moon disappears, but because of the, uh, the red light, it's the only light that survives. The trip through the Earth's atmosphere out to the moon, blue light gets scattered out. That's why it appears red. It depends on how thick it is. The moon can almost be invisible at times. But that last September was a super flood moon. It's interesting. Speaking about the moon, where it's, how is it aligned in terms of its orbit? Is it like at our equator? No, that's a good question. It's actually a little over five degrees to walk to the to the orbit to the so much to the to the Earth's equator. The, yeah, it's five degrees. Here's the Earth's plane, right? It's five degrees like this. So the moon orbits five degrees above or below. So that's why it doesn't happen every month. And the conditions uh, on that uh, uh, star, they are similar to our solar system? Oh, we don't know. We, we, um, there are the Kepler Space Telescope is an ongoing 
mission of the Triangle Mission. Just actively looking at what we call the exoplanets, planets in orbit around the stars. And it's found quite a few of them. And it's more than one. We found actual solar systems around other stars um, using the Kepler Space Telescope. To answer your question, are those planets like ours? That's your question. Are those planets similar to ours? Yes, uh, like possible or? Oh, with this one, yes. Earth class planet, one of the big things we look for is like, because of the mass, the gravity, and all that, um, this is where we evolved. So the first place we would look to find life is the analog of our own planet. Uh, as for Earth, they have, they are growing travels uh, last month on the international space station. Yes. They are starting uh, growing vegetables and flowers also. I just I didn't the know. It's just the space station. The space station, they were growing vegetables and, and, and fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, yes. What was the uh, cartoon mascot? Oh, that was that was our that was our mas that was our mascot for the kids program. Oh yeah, that was that was basically the feeling. Sometimes that such a there was a international conference in which this topic was discussed in the late 1960s or 70. Yes. In which it was the result that a mass form of life. They cannot uh, cannot uh, adapt to those conditions. Life um, may be there, but a Mars, Mars form of life may not be there. You mean on Mars? Yes, on Mars or uh, in our at, at least in our solar system, a right. Mars form of life is not possible. Life is very hard. We're finding life in the most uh, what would be what would seem impossible place in this impossible, really extremes in temperature, like we find. Bacteria, that's volcanoes. In fact, that we think we saw a fossil on a meteor that came down from Mars. Now, early on, the solar system was a place back, considered a, a game of, you can think of it as a billiard ball, billiard ball game on steroids. Things, there was collisions everywhere, bombardments, the, the late bombardment phase was about 15 years ago. So, all the planets were being impacted. Some of them were so energetic that you know, impact was hitting Mars, asteroids and meteors hitting Mars. The ejector actually came back to Earth and we found it in some rocks from Mars. And we looked at it and we thought we saw fossilized bacteria. This is what the news was, yes. The, the geology of it, we've, we've, since the 70s, we've had space probes on Mars. First it was the, the um, I think that we had the, the Sojourner and the, Voy the Voyager, not Voyager, the lander, one of the landers in the late 70s, there were two of them, actually scooped up Martian soil, analyzed, and sent us back a whole profile of the, of the Martian chemistry. Right now we have the Curiosity rover, we have um, Spirit and Opportunity, three, three ongoing missions right now that are Roaming the Martian surface, taking pictures, analyzing the surface and the soil. So we have a good idea of the composition of the Martian soil. So when we find this rock and we compare it to that, it's very, it's the same. Oh, okay. Now, uh, if I'm not mistaken, before you said for the light to from the sun to here is eight minutes. Yes. But I'm guessing from the sun to Mars is twenty. Minutes? From us to, it's longer. From us to Mars. We would add 20 to 28 minutes. From a, suppose here's the sun, here's the earth, here's Mars. Yeah. So this is eight minutes. Yeah. From here to here is another 20. So the total light time from the sun is 28 minutes. So Mars is like two and a half, almost three times. It's twice the distance. From it's, us to the sun. At 20, it depends on which side of the sun. Oh. 20 is the travel time to here, 20 minute travel time, and that's when it's on the other side of the solar system. So if it's close by here, it might be 10, 15 minutes by travel time. Is the planet going to be on the Alpha Centauri system that's already stated? Do we know if it's in the heavens or on Earth? 
Yes, it is in the haplophosome. Yes, that's where they call it. Hence the name. Very good. Hence the name haplophosome. That little guy. The question was where it asked before. Yeah, this little guy, this little mascot. That's all mascot. So we're trying to make this program. Um, For children. People of all ages. Children included. Yes. Um, well, like the haplophosome plants that we're doing, that's pretty rare, but like that, um, um, just like normal, like you said, bacteria. That's yes. almost going to be almost everywhere. Um, you, see, I, you see clouds and ice on part of Mars or water or something. But if so, that to me means life is that some form of life. That's everywhere. But to get one, so isn't that where you see all this? Like it has the, the top of it has ice or clouds and stuff. Or so so what, isn't that everywhere that you see something like that would have life? Like some oh, form. Oh, I see what you're saying. The question is, wherever we would find similar conditions to what we have here? Well, like you see clouds, a little bit of cloud or ice on the part of Mars. Yes. See, the thing with Mars is, is right same now, everything. Mars, we're trying to find water on Mars. We think more of some of the, the hematite, there's a mineral on Mars we see an abundance of hematite. Hematite only forms in the presence of water. And we've identified this hematite, and it's pretty new. So within the last few thousand years, there was water there. What's happened? Where did that water go? Where you have water, you probably have life. So um, is the life underwater underneath the Martian crust? We don't know. The amount of energy you would take from finding materials and build it would exceed the amount of energy you would get from it. It makes no sense. So there are problems with the Dyson sphere. So Freeman Dyson proposed that. It's the same guy who's in that picture. Old gentleman, he's an English physicist. But uh, that was one proposition we had. So that it was a Dyson sphere, it's not a Dyson sphere. It's, uh, it's just happy star in a very uh, gas and dust rich part of the galaxy. That, that's what it is. Is there any, um, any, anything else weird visually, likewise, that would stand out? I've seen some of this lab. I've found the little things that actually lead to something. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank, thank you. Very important. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you. If you want, though, get on a mailing list. Yeah, we'll yeah. 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 Thank you. 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 Anyway, if anybody has any questions, that's all for tonight. Thank you for coming out. Uh, yes. Yeah. Right here. That's right. You are welcome. Yes. Everything's there. Good. It's the town that you're going to set. We have a newsletter. We have a Twitter account. So it's astronomy chain. If they get if they get their emails, you can send that. Yes, I will send you the email. Let's make it our uh, organizing uh, the It's through the library. Uh, yeah, uh, book uh, oh, Kevin Lamp? Uh, you have some. Who's ever heard of the Hapital Zone? Me! <laughs> you? Yes. Hapital Zone is the region around every star where water can exist in the state. And that planet, yes, is in the Hapital Zone, the Proxima Centauri. Do you know about the chemical composition? Not yet. It's too soon. It's too soon. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of this. We have some telescope time. We're trying to figure that out. Yeah. See, Haberdal Sun is the, the area uh, away from the sun where it's not too cold and not too hot. Yes. So life can exist. Yes. 